at 4.30 on the morning of April 12, 1861. A shell exploded over Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Soon, hundreds of shells were fired into the fort, reducing its interior to rubble. These were the opening hostile acts of the American Civil War. The war would claim more than one million lives on countless battlefields. Millions more would be maimed. Billions of dollars in property would be destroyed. One region of the country, the South, would be utterly ruined. Hello, I'm Kent Masterson Brown. Welcome to Witnessing History's Henry Clay and the Struggle for the Union. How did such a cataclysmic tragedy as the American Civil War happen? The seeds of that war were planted by the first English settlers on the North American continent in the early 17th century. By the time of the ratification of the Constitution in 1789, those seeds had grown. And between the ratification of the Constitution and the outbreak of the Civil War, there were eruptions, some of which nearly led to civil war. And there were those who sought compromise. And none of them was more notable than Henry Clay of Kentucky. Brought to you by Dupree & Company serves as the investment advisor to Dupree Mutual Funds, which offers a family of no-load municipal bond funds. Owned and operated by the Dupree family for 70 years, the firm has been an innovator in public finance. The Lexington Convention and Visitors Bureau is your resource to the horse capital of the world. Come discover the rich heritage and history that Lexington and Central Kentucky has to share. You can plan your trip to the bluegrass online at visitlex.com. And the 16th College in America when it was founded in 1780, at Transylvania University, we question everything so as to accomplish anything. Located in downtown Lexington, Kentucky, Transylvania University has been consistently ranked as one of the top liberal arts colleges in America. This film also made possible by donations from the McConnell Center for Political Leadership at the University of Louisville and Michael Rowati, Winchester, Kentucky. What was the union that Henry Clay struggled to hold together? How was it formed? What was its nature? And why was there a struggle for the union? With the Treaty of Paris in 1783, the American Revolution ended. The revolution had been won by 13 United States that were strung out along the Atlantic coast, from New Hampshire on the north to Georgia on the south. Eight years of war had illustrated the need for cooperative action among the states in their defense from a common enemy. Peacetime brought about the need for cooperative action in the regulation of commerce between those states. The Articles of Confederation, the first Constitution of the United States, had proven to be inadequate to meet those needs. In the summer of 1787, delegates from 12 of the 13 states met in Philadelphia to draft a Constitution that would hopefully meet those needs. 
That constitution was completed on September 17, 1787, and sent to the states for ratification. It gave to Congress certain limited and enumerated powers. Among them were the powers to provide for the common defense and to regulate commerce among the several states. The states reserved most other powers. Importantly, the delegates in Philadelphia created a federal government by the Constitution, not a national government. Article 7 of the Constitution stated that the ratification of the Constitution of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states so ratifying the same. Some framers of the Constitution understood the document to be an agreement among the states, a contract, if you will, and like a contract, it was subject to being rescinded or canceled by one or more states if other states and or the federal government breached its terms. In this context, for a state to rescind its ratification of the Constitution meant that it seceded from the Union. Ratification was not easy. After bitter conventions in Virginia and New York, the Constitution was finally ratified by 11 states by the summer of 1789, but the votes were very narrow. Although slavery was common in all the United States before the Revolution, by the time the Constitution was ratified, the states of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia were dependent upon it. Although the framers never used the terms slaves or slavery in the Constitution, they agreed that a fraction of the African-American slaves would be counted for purposes of determining for each state the number of its members to the House of Representatives. They also agreed that free African-Americans would be fully counted. The economic bases of the southern states were wholly agricultural, and those states made sure that the Constitution at least allowed a fraction of the slaves to be counted for purposes of determining their House members. Without that minimal recognition, southern states would have never ratified the Constitution. There would have been no united states. Northern states being generally smaller in land mass and more populated, and having more limited growing seasons due to climate, turned increasingly to mining, manufacturing, and foreign trade to fuel their economies. They all legally abolished slavery by the early 19th century, and there were those in the northern states who sought to abolish slavery in all the states, and their voices grew louder and louder with the passing years. The contract nature of the Constitution and the Constitution's oblique acknowledgement that there were slaves in the southern states were two elements in the formation of the Union that created the legal chemistry for southern states to threaten secession each time the future of slavery was seriously questioned in Congress. The one catalyst that would accelerate the instability of the Union was the westward expansion of the United States. Kentucky was admitted to the Union in 1792 along with Vermont. Kentucky, settled largely by Virginians, was a slave state. Vermont was a free state. Tennessee a slave state was admitted to the Union in 1796, and Ohio, a free state, was admitted in 1803. Louisiana, a slave state, was admitted in 1812, and Indiana, a free state, was admitted to the Union in 1814. Illinois, a free state, was admitted to the Union in 1819, and Alabama, a slave state, was also admitted in that year. By 1819, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states. 
as each state had two United States senators under the Constitution. Any attempts by the free states to limit, restrict, undermine, or abolish slavery by legislation or constitutional amendment could be blocked in the Senate. Maintaining that balance of power was essential to Southern states. Importantly, slave states were not protective of the institution of slavery because all their people wanted slavery or believed in it morally. Many white Southerners disliked the institution of slavery. Many believed it to be immoral. To be sure, some white Southerners had become heavily invested in the institution of slavery and sought to protect their investment. Slavery had been a fact of life in the Southern states for more than 175 years before the Constitution. Slavery had expanded as those states had increased in population and new lands were open to settlement. Those states staple crops, cotton, sugar, tobacco, and rice, required vast amounts of land for their profitable cultivation. And those crops, particularly cotton, burned out the soil to such a degree, westward expansion was necessary for the survival of that economic base. Those crops also required large forces of labor to plant, grow, harvest, and prepare them for market. For all its evils, slavery enabled agriculture to become the economic mainstay of the southern states. Most white Southerners in the 19th century believed that any attempts on the part of northern states and the federal government to limit or abolish slavery would be economically and socially catastrophic. Attempts to limit slavery would cripple their ability to expand the South's economic base. Abolishing slavery would set loose millions of African-American slaves with no place or means to live. There was no public assistance then. Most white Southerners believed that abolition would cause the region to descend into chaos and bloodshed. Abolition agitation created a crisis of fear. But slavery was contrary to the very precepts of America. Freedom, liberty, the dignity of the individual, and independence. The framers of the Constitution recognized that. Stories of human beings in chains, being sold at auctions as families were divided, being beaten and mistreated were as real as the imagery of the times portrayed it. Yet if slavery was to be eradicated, most white Southerners argued that each slave state, not the federal government, should determine the timing and the means. How slavery could be abolished by the states was a question for which no one could provide any ready answers. By the early 19th century, the American South was existing in that unenviable space between the moral wrong of slavery and the absolute fear of the consequences of abolition. And fear trumped all other considerations. President Thomas Jefferson's 1803 purchase from Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte of France of much of the territory drained by the Mississippi and Missouri rivers known as the Louisiana Purchase, provided the tipping point. The Louisiana Purchase contained some 829,000 square miles that included the present-day states of Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and parts of Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Mexico, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and Louisiana. The burning question was, when states were carved out of the Louisiana Purchase and admitted to the Union by Congress, 
Could that balance of power between slave states and free states be maintained? What if the balance of power could not be maintained? Would the Union disintegrate? In 1812, an entirely unsuspected flashpoint arose that nearly ruptured the Union, a second war with Great Britain. It wasn't so much the war itself that caused the problem as the embargo placed upon foreign trade by the administration of President James Madison. New England relied upon that foreign trade, and the embargo crippled the region economically. So harmful was the embargo that Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and delegates from New Hampshire and Vermont called for a convention to meet in the old State House in Hartford, Connecticut in 1814 to consider rescinding their ratifications of the Constitution and seceding from the Union. The threat of secession from New England was blunted by another extraordinary event, the defeat of a British force by General Andrew Jackson's motley American army at New Orleans on January 8, 1815. A peace treaty had been signed at Ghent, Belgium, ending the war only days before. Victory, though, came with a price, a heavy national debt. That debt plunged the nation into economic depression by 1819. In the midst of the nation's economic woes, the first state entirely west of the Mississippi River to be carved out of the Louisiana Purchase, petitioned Congress for statehood in 1819. It was Missouri. Missouri would be admitted to the Union as a slave state. Another slave state, Alabama, had just been admitted to the Union, making the number of free states and slave states equal. Missouri's admission to the Union as a slave state would upset the balance of power. Representative James Talmadge of New York proposed an amendment to Missouri's petition prohibiting the introduction of slaves into Missouri and freeing those born in Missouri upon reaching 25 years of age. The arguments over Missouri's admission and the Talmadge Amendment became heated and bitter. Southerners argued that Talmadge's amendment was unconstitutional and threatened secession if it was enacted. Northerners argued about the evils of slavery and upheld the powers of Congress over the territories. A compromise was presented to the House of Representatives. It called upon Missouri to be admitted as a slave state but prohibited slavery in the Louisiana Purchase Territory north of the 36 degree, 30 minute parallel, except within the boundaries of the proposed state of Missouri. At the time that compromise was presented to the House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House was 42 year old Henry Clay of Kentucky. Born in Hanover County, Virginia in 1777, Clay had migrated to Kentucky in 1797 after studying law in Richmond, Virginia under George Wythe, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Clay had spoken in favor of Kentucky nullifying the Alien and Sedition Acts enacted by Congress in 1798. The next year, he married Lucretia Hart daughter of one of Kentucky's most prominent early settlers. By 1806, Clay was a professor of law at Transylvania University. So quickly did Clay rise to political prominence that he was elected United States Senator in 1806 to fill the seat vacated by John Breckinridge, who became President Thomas Jefferson's Attorney General. In 1807, Clay was elected Speaker of the Kentucky House of Representatives. He was then appointed United States Senator again in 1810. Elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1811, 
Clay was chosen speaker on the first day of his first session in Congress. That had never been done before and has never been done since. During his 14 years in the United States House of Representatives, Clay would be elected speaker six times. Clay was a hotspur. During the War of 1812, Clay was a war hawk, arguing not only fighting Great Britain, but invading Canada. He fought several notable duels, but he became a commissioner who negotiated the Treaty of Ghent ending the War of 1812 in 1815. Clay had an imperious temper and ardent combativeness that hurried him and his party into disadvantageous positions. Carl Schurz. Beyond his temperament, Clay had a personal stake in the great question facing Missouri's admission to the Union. Clay owned slaves at his estate near Lexington known as Ashland, and he represented a slave state, Kentucky. The Missouri question troubled Clay. Particularly troubling to him were the threats of secession and civil war that came from both sides of the question. Every matter of public concern has given way to the Missouri question, which engrosses the whole thoughts of the members and constitutes almost the only topic of conversation. And it is a most unhappy question awakening sectional feelings and exasperating them to the highest degree. The words civil war and disunion are uttered almost without emotion. A senator said the other day that he would rather have both civil war and disunion than fail in the resolution. Henry Clay. Southern representatives and senators argued that slavery was recognized by the Constitution. They argued that if Missouri was not admitted as a slave state, its citizens would be denied express constitutional protections. If Missouri was not admitted as a slave state, Southerners argued that the free states and the federal government would be in breach of the Constitution giving the slave states the right to rescind their ratifications of the Constitution and secede. The representatives and senators from free states argued that slavery was morally wrong and that the Declaration of Independence contained the words, all men are created equal. They argued that if Missouri was admitted as a slave state, Southern interests would dominate the federal government and those interests were antithetical to Northern interests. Only 30 years after the ratification of the Constitution, the nation was on the brink of disunion and civil war. Hope for a compromise came about in 1820 when Maine, then a part of Massachusetts, applied for statehood as a free state. The Senate passed the Missouri and Maine petitions in one bill, admitting Missouri as a slave state and admitting Maine as a free state. It then tied to the bill an amendment, prohibiting the extension of slavery into the territory of the Louisiana Purchase north of the 36 degree, 30 minute parallel, except for Missouri. The House of Representatives rejected the Senate bill. A joint committee was then named from both houses. With Clay's influence, the joint committee submitted to the Senate and the House three different bills. One, Missouri's admission as a slave state. Two, Maine's admission as a free state. And three, the limitation of slavery north of the 36 degree, 30 minute parallel, except for Missouri. Each of the three bills passed on March 2nd, 1820. The Missouri question, however, was far from over. Missouri had inserted in its own state constitution a clause forbidding free Negroes and mulattoes from entering Missouri. 
that violated the Privileges and Immunities Clause of Article 4 of the United States Constitution. This presented a more serious problem than Missouri's original petition for statehood. Accusations and recriminations flew about, threatening those who advanced Missouri's petition and those who opposed it. Both parties appealed to Henry Clay. Clay assumed a new character. There were no threats or abuse. All is mild, humble, and persuasive. He begs, entreats, adjures, supplicates, and beseeches us to have mercy upon the people of Missouri. Senator William Plummer of New Hampshire. William Eustace of Massachusetts then resolved the House that Missouri be admitted to the Union on the condition that the offensive language be removed. But Clay feared Missouri would leave the Union if that resolution passed. He feared Kentucky, Tennessee, and even Ohio would leave the Union if the Eustis resolution was adopted. Clay took the resolution off the House floor and sent the question to a select committee on compromise that he named himself. The Committee on Compromise ultimately reported that Missouri be admitted to the Union upon the fundamental condition that its legislature would never enact any laws preventing any description of person from settling in Missouri who could otherwise become a citizen of any other state in the Union. But the Missouri question had to wait on final resolution. The nation had just come through a tumultuous presidential election in 1820. Congress met in a joint session to count the electoral votes. Would Missouri's votes be counted? Clay moved the votes of all states be counted before Missouri's. He believed James Monroe would win easily, making Missouri's votes perfunctory. Monroe did win easily. Clay was honorable to himself and useful to his country. In all subsequent scenes of disorder and confusion, he kept his party down and thus brought the election to a close in peace, if not tranquility. Senator William Plummer. On February 22, 1821, Clay moved the House of Representatives for the appointment of a special committee of 23 members to consider the report of the Committee on Compromise. Now, gentlemen, we do not want a proposition carried here by a small majority, thereupon reported to the House and rejected. I and for something practical, something conclusive, something decisive upon the question. Henry Clay. Clay then asked each member how he will vote, putting each one on the spot in front of his fellow members. The final vote was nearly unanimous. The substance of the report finally passed both houses. On August 10, 1821, President James Monroe signed the bill. Missouri was admitted to the Union as a slave state. The nation had narrowly avoided disunion and civil war. Clay had shown unexampled perseverance, it was written. But the threat of disunion and civil war over slavery caused Americans in the North as well as the South including former President Thomas Jefferson, to shudder in fear. The Missouri question was like a fire bell in the night. It awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. Thomas Jefferson. Although the Union trembled, Clay was on the rise as a national political figure. His rise, though, was abruptly taken off track by his role in the hotly contested presidential election of 1824, 
in which he was one of four major candidates. With a deadlock in the Electoral College, Clay cast the deciding vote in the House of Representatives for John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts over Andrew Jackson of Tennessee. Clay was then named Secretary of State by President Adams, bringing scorn upon him from political opponents who asserted that he had entered into a corrupt bargain with Adams to place himself in a position to run for the presidency. Clay did run for the presidency in 1832, advancing his American system. He supported the levying of taxes for internal improvements, roads, canals, railroads, wharves, and shipping lanes. He advocated increasing American manufacturing. Among the tax measures Clay supported was a high protective tariff that had been advanced by President John Quincy Adams and passed by Congress in 1828. Although the tariff of 1828 protected northern manufacturing by making it more expensive to import foreign manufactured goods, it crippled southern agricultural states that manufactured little and relied upon imports. Now conflict emerged between North and South over an issue that had nothing directly to do with slavery. The old Capitol building was the site of intensely bitter arguments and recriminations. The nation was coming apart again. Here in the old Senate chamber in January 1830, Senator Robert Y. Hain of South Carolina spoke for hours on nullifying the tariff and secession, recalling the Hartford Convention of 1814 and the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions nullifying the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. Then, in front of a packed gallery in this old Senate chamber, Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts replied to Hayne in a speech lasting nearly two days. When my eyes shall return to behold for the last time the sun in heaven, may I not see him shining on the broken and dishonored fragments of a once glorious union, on states dissevered, discordant, belligerent, on a land rent with civil feuds or drenched, it may be, in fraternal blood, let their last feeble and lingering glance rather behold the gorgeous ensign of the Republic, not a stripe erased or polluted, nor a single star obscured. Liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. Daniel Webster. Those were words school children would memorize. Those were words Union soldiers would recall as they went to war 31 years later. A convention in South Carolina passed an ordinance of nullification on November 24, 1832, declaring the tariff null, void, and not law or binding. South Carolina, as a party to the Constitution, claimed it had a right to protect its citizens from injury caused by other states and the federal government. If the tariff was not repealed, South Carolina would secede. To prevent the collection of the tariff and to protect its citizens, South Carolina called out its state militia to keep federal officials from collecting the tariff in the ports of the state. President Andrew Jackson an ardent champion of states' rights, nevertheless responded to South Carolina on December 10, 1832, with a proclamation asserting that disunion by armed force is treason. Jackson warned of dreadful consequences and punishment if South Carolina blocks the enforcement of the tariff. South Carolina dared Jackson to send a military force to stop it. The nation was on the brink 
of civil war again. Henry Clay, who had been elected to the United States Senate from Kentucky in 1831, proposed a compromise. He proposed that the tariff remain in force until March 3rd, 1840, at which time it would be repealed. Between 1832 and 1840, no high duties would be enacted. Clay was willing to sacrifice a key element of his own American system to avoid disunion and civil war. He had supported Kentucky nullifying the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798, but now sought to keep South Carolina from nullifying the tariff. His opponents called him two-faced. Clay began to work with Northeastern industrialists, then with Southern congressmen to find a compromise. He moved among a select caucus of senators and representatives. Then Senator Hayne resigned from the Senate to become governor of South Carolina. Andrew Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun, then resigned and was quickly elected by South Carolina's legislature to fill the Senate seat just vacated by Robert Hayne so that he could join the debate to defend South Carolina's nullification of the tariff. On January 16, 1833, the confrontation took an even more ominous turn. Andrew Jackson submitted to the Congress the force bill authorizing him to call out the state militias, the United States Navy, and the United States Army to force the collection of tariff revenues in South Carolina. The force bill was approved by the Senate on February 20, 1833. Clay supported the bill but Southern senators walked out of the Senate chamber. War seemed certain. South Carolina was arming its harbors and port cities. Any attempt by President Jackson to send troops to enforce the tariff would be met by force. Clay quickly met with Calhoun and other members of Congress trying to find some common ground. Time was running out. Clay then offered a revised compromise on February 11, 1833. Here in Clay's own handwriting, he called for a nine and a half year period of time with small reductions in the tariff. Then on July 1, 1842, the tariff rates would drop sharply. Calhoun and many of Calhoun's closest political allies were looking for some way to avoid the impending clash with federal troops yet prevail. Calhoun accepted Clay's proposal and sold it to his fellow South Carolinians. Clay's compromise passed both houses of Congress on March 1st, 1833. The Compromise of 1833 was the most important congressional date that ever occurred. It was the most proud and triumphant day of my life. Henry Clay. The nation had avoided disunion and civil war for the second time in less than 15 years. Clay served in the United States Senate until 1842 as a bitter opponent of Andrew Jackson. He ran for the Whig nomination for the presidency in 1840, but lost to war hero William Henry Harrison who was elected president. Clay was nominated by the Whigs to run for the presidency in 1844 against James K. Polk of Tennessee. Clay opposed annexing the Republic of Texas to the Union as a slave state because it would reawaken the slave issue and provoke Mexico to declare war. Polk favored the annexation of Texas and his advocacy of it in the face of threats from Mexico was supported by most of the American public. Clay, who promoted himself as the farmer of Ashland, lost the election to Polk. After repeated incidents over the border between Texas and Mexico, 
the United States went to war with Mexico in 1846. In that war, Clay lost his favorite son, Colonel Henry Clay Jr., commander of a regiment of Kentucky infantry. Young Clay was mortally wounded at the Battle of Buena Vista. As the war with Mexico ended, Clay faced the twilight of his political life. After losing the Whig nomination for the presidency to Mexican war hero and fellow Kentuckian General Zachary Taylor in 1848, Clay retired to Ashland, his estate east of Lexington, Kentucky. Clay, however, was soon elected to return to the United States Senate in 1849. But Clay's warnings about the admission of Texas came true. The slave issue came to the forefront, with Texas possibly being admitted as a slave state. And the stakes were higher than they had ever been. There were nearly four million African-American slaves living in the southern states. By 1849, Clay was presented with the most difficult sectional questions ever. With the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo concluding the Mexican War, vast lands were ceded to the United States by Mexico. Most were south of the Missouri Compromise Line. To compound the matter, gold was found in California in 1849 and the numbers of settlers entering the Mexican cession lands were overwhelming. The Capitol building was the site of rancorous arguments and recriminations again. Alarmed that the newly acquired territory and Texas would eventually represent slave states, Representative David Wilmot of Pennsylvania proposed a resolution preventing the extension of slavery into any new territory. Then, California petitioned for admission to the Union, although the Missouri Compromise Line actually divided that territory. The issues were extraordinarily complex. Should Texas be admitted as a slave state? And what about the western border of Texas? And should the United States absorb the debts of the Republic of Texas? What about all the lands added to the United States from its war with Mexico? Those lands included the present-day states of California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, and Utah. And could Congress constitutionally deny the citizens of those territories the right to own slaves? And what about the admission of California? It was theoretically divided by the Missouri Compromise Line. Should it be admitted as a free state or a slave state? To complicate the matter, there were other issues. There was a drive in Congress to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia. And there was another drive in Congress to abolish the slave trade throughout the nation. Southern representatives and senators threatened that their states would secede if either one of those measures succeeded. Northern representatives, in turn, threatened civil war if any of those states seceded. Clay was ill. He, like John C. Calhoun, was suffering from tuberculosis. Daniel Webster was ill. They had all served in the House or Senate since the early years of the Republic. Clay called upon Daniel Webster for help. Clay introduced on the Senate floor a compromise on January 29, 1850. The compromise consisted of six separate bills that called for one, California to be admitted as a state without reference to slavery. Two, territorial governments of the remaining portion of the Mexican addition to be organized without congressional restriction on slavery. Popular vote would resolve the question in the territories. 
Three, the boundary of Texas would be resolved. Four, the debts of Texas would be assumed by the United States so long as Texas relinquished claims to any part of New Mexico. Five, slavery would not be abolished in the District of Columbia without the consent of the people of Maryland and those living in the District of Columbia and without just compensation to slave owners. Six, the slave trade would be abolished in the District of Columbia. Seven, a more effective fugitive slave law would be enacted. And eight, Congress would acknowledge it had no power to interfere in the interstate slave trade. Clay claimed his compromise was founded upon mutual forbearance. Without a compromise, the nation would be plunged into disunion and civil war. Clay turned to the people for support. He met daily with a caucus of Whigs and Democrats committed to preserving the Union to encourage them. On February 5, 1850, Clay was escorted into the Senate. He was very ill and weak. The galleries were packed. Clay's speech was a plea for the Union. The alternative? was war and the extermination of liberty. If the direful and sad event of the dissolution of the Union shall happen, may I not survive to behold the sad and heart-rending spectacle. Henry Clay. Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina was then escorted into this old Senate chamber. He was so ill and weak, he could not speak at all himself. Senator John Mason of Virginia read Calhoun's remarks. Calhoun reminded everyone of all the anti-slave agitation over the years. He then listed all the efforts to restrict slavery to the states where it existed in the current debate, denying white Southerners the right to expand westward like Northerners. Disunion is all that is left for us. John C. Calhoun. Calhoun would die on March 31st. Senator Daniel Webster then spoke in favor of Clay's compromise on March 7, a position that cost Webster much of his own anti-slavery constituency in Massachusetts. I go for honorable compromise whenever it can be made. Life itself is the struggle continuing throughout our whole existence until the great destroyer finally triumphs. All legislation, all government, all society is formed upon the principle of mutual concession, politeness, comity, courtesy, upon these Everything is based. Compromises have their recommendation that if you concede anything, you have something conceded to you in return. Henry Clay. The Senate finally voted to approve a special committee to consider Clay's proposed compromise. Clay was presented with a report of the committee on May 8, 1850, it was much the same as Clay's original proposed compromise. The report was reduced to an omnibus bill. The bill was defeated. It was a crushing defeat for Clay. Civil war loomed. Clay left Washington, D.C. He briefly returned to Kentucky to be with his wife, Lucretia. Clay was very ill. Young Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois stepped into the limelight. He believed that if Clay's proposals were introduced as separate bills, the compromise had a chance of passage. In Clay's absence, Douglas set about trying to advance Clay's compromise measures one bill at a time. Miraculously, 
the Congress passed each one of the original Clay proposals as separate bills introduced by Senator Douglas in August and September 1850. Clay came back to Washington, D.C. to see his last and most impressive compromise enacted by Congress. War had been avoided for the time being. Finally, on June 29, 1852, Clay died in Washington, D.C. Clay's remains were returned to Kentucky, first to Louisville and finally to his home in Lexington. A long procession led Clay's last earthly remains to the Lexington Cemetery. There, they were finally buried. A little known former one-term congressman from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, remarked that Clay was his beau ideal of a statesman. A native Kentuckian, Lincoln would be elected as a Republican, President of the United States in November 1860. Lincoln had been publicly critical of slavery, and he was supported by outspoken abolitionists like William Seward of New York, Salmon P. Chase of Ohio, and other Republicans who were quickly elevated to cabinet positions. Fearful of the policies of the incoming Lincoln administration, South Carolina finally rescinded its ratification of the Constitution and seceded from the Union in December 1860. Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Tennessee, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Virginia followed South Carolina out of the Union in the winter and spring of 1861. In the years between the Compromise of 1850 and the election of Lincoln, there had been bloodshed over the organization of the territories of Kansas and Nebraska. There had been bloodshed in Missouri. There had been violent confrontations between members of Congress. All of the violence had been over the question of slavery in the new territories. All the voices of moderation and compromise were gone. The nation was completely polarized. All trust between the North and the South was gone. In the midst of all the chaos, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, from this bench, issued the opinion of the Supreme Court in 1857 in a case brought by a Missouri slave named Dred Scott, who had entered a free state, Illinois, seeking emancipation. Taney opined that Scott was not a citizen, so he couldn't bring the lawsuit and the Missouri Compromise Line, which Scott argued gave him his freedom once he crossed it and entered a free state, was unconstitutional. Abolitionists were outraged. Then John Brown, a fanatic who had led bloody reprisals against white slave owners in Kansas, tried to instigate a slave uprising in Virginia by raiding the United States Armory at Harper's Ferry in October 1859 to seize the weapons made there. Brown was captured and hanged, dying in martyrdom to many. In Southern states, the fear of federally enforced abolition reached crisis proportions. In the end, the conflict between North and South, free states, and slave states proved to be irrepressible. Among white Southerners, fear finally trumped all other considerations. As they almost did during the tariff crisis of 1833, Southern guns finally opened up on a federal garrison holding Fort Sumter in the entrance to Charleston Harbor on April 12, 1861 the Civil War began. 
In a touch of complete irony, the federal garrison that was fired upon was commanded by Major Robert Anderson, a Kentuckian who had been a slave owner. Yet Henry Clay's efforts had forestalled conflict for more than 40 years. Were those 40 years necessary for the Union to survive a civil war? Had secession occurred earlier, would the nation have survived? We will never know the answers to those questions. But Clay's efforts at compromise, in and of themselves, must be regarded as among the most notable achievements of any American ever elected to public office. Henry Clay and the Struggle for the Union was brought to you by Dupree Mutual Funds, based in Lexington, Kentucky, offering no-load municipal bond funds throughout the Southeast. You can call us or visit our website to request a free copy of our prospectus. Any prospectus should be read carefully before making an investment. The Lexington Convention and Visitors Bureau is your resource to the horse capital of the world. Come discover the rich heritage and history that Lexington and Central Kentucky has to share. You can plan your trip to the bluegrass online at visitlex.com. And the 16th College in America when it was founded in 1780. At Transylvania University, we question everything so as to accomplish anything. Located in downtown Lexington, Kentucky, Transylvania University has been consistently ranked as one of the top liberal arts colleges in America. This film also made possible by donations from the McConnell Center for Political Leadership at the University of Louisville and Michael Rowati, Winchester, Kentucky.